gerrymandered state, but in general, who don't show up and aren't accountable and transparent to constituents, you have an obligation to vote those people out regardless of the party they come from. And my opponent doesn't show up. He hasn't had a town hall in over a year. He won't debate. I think it's because he doesn't want to look bad standing next to a 28-year-old who is fired up and ready to go. (laughs) But either way, that is not acceptable in a democracy. When democracy fails to to have open discussion, debate, and discuss all the ideas and visions that we may or may not agree on, uh, that is when democracy begins to fail us. And so the only way we can keep our democracy invigorated is if we agree to vote for people who are available to the people they're supposed to represent. And that's what our campaign has tried to show from beginning to the end and will continue to represent that when elected. That's awesome. How, if people want to get involved in your campaign or maybe donate some money to your campaign, how can they do that? Well, we're always on social media. We love hearing from people on social media. So if you're listening to this podcast right now, it's Watts for Congress on Facebook, uh, Watts the number four Congress on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, But as always, our website is the best place to read up on our platform, to donate, to sign up, to volunteer. Whether you're in North Carolina or want to write some postcards to some North Carolinians, we can hook all of that up. And that's wattsforcongress.com. W-A-T-T-S-F-O-R congress.com. Excellent. And we'll put links uh, for your website and your social media up on our website as well. And uh, I hope people uh, who are local can come check you out and get some donuts and coffee. (laughs) (laughs) Can't canvas without donuts and coffee. I I cannot stress enough how much donuts (laughs) could, could bring me out to canvas. If you're listening, anyone in Illinois. (laughs) So uh, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited, even though it makes me feel very old, that you're quite a bit younger than I am and are running for Congress. I'm so excited that there are people uh, from the the generation behind mine that are stepping up and saying we need to change things. I think that's really great. The future is now, and I really appreciate y'all having me on today. And also want to thank y'all a lot for helping raise political awareness and raising the level of political discourse in this country because we are not the divided states of America. Last time I checked, we're the United States of America, and we better start acting like it or we're going to end up in a really dangerous spot. And so thank you for having me and for, and for doing everything that you do every day. Uh, we need more folks like you, uh, and we need more listeners uh, who are listening to this like you as well. So thank you so much. Tonight, we're joined by Sheraton Love, who is the Democratic nominee for the North Carolina Senate in District 29. Hi, Sheraton. Hi. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me on. So could you just tell us a little bit of background about who you are and why you've decided to run for the state Senate? So I am married with three daughters. They are eight, five, and three. My husband and I live in Thomasville, which is a small town in Davidson County, and he grew up here. So as our family got larger, we knew that we wanted to be near family. We wanted to just feel safe and surrounded by people we love. So this has been a great place for that. Work-wise, I work full-time. I am a dean and a biology professor at my alma mater, which is Winston-Salem State University. And a big part of why I'm running is education. You know, if anyone following North Carolina politics at all right now knows that education is a huge issue and and we're not doing enough in Raleigh to support our teachers and our students all the way from pre-K to K through 12 and higher ed. So it's just a big issue that I care about and one of the big reasons I'm running. Great. And so you described a little bit. Can you tell us a little bit more about District 29? I know there's been some redistricting, so <laughs> things are yes. uh, a little <laughs> bit unclear to me. So I think the uh, the incumbent for this district is now in a different district. So where, what all does District 29 sort of represent? What, what sorts of people live there? Right. So the, the new District 29 is all of Davidson County, where I live, and all of Montgomery County. Davidson County is larger as far as number of registered voters. It has 
what used to be a large manufacturing kind of district, particularly Thomasville, is still known internationally for furniture. Lexington is, is kind of the same similar story. A lot of the textile industry and that kind of thing left. And so I think most of the area is is coming back stronger with small businesses and you know entrepreneurship, innovation. So we're kind of in this reinventing ourselves story, which I really like. Montgomery County is more rural. Um, it's covered quite a bit by the Uhari National Forest and Baden Lake. So there's a tourist element there. But I think farming is a big part of that county. So they're really pretty different as far as counties go to be in the same district. But a lot of great folks that I've been meeting, you know, in both counties. Since this is a new district, it's unclear to me what the breakdown by uh, political party might be. Do you have any sense for, and you ran unopposed in the primary, so we don't have, you know, vote totals there to, to go by. So do you know kind of what the breakdown might be now? I do, particularly in Davidson County, again, which is the larger kind of voting block of the district. It is roughly 45% Republican or so. And then I think like 25% Democrat and 25% unaffiliated. And then Montgomery County, which is really different. Again, it's got a smaller, you know, group that are registered voters, but they have a slight edge on Democrats, registered Democrats in that county. So they're a little bit larger in the amount of Democrats compared to Republicans and unaffiliated. I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about some of the issues. What sorts of things are you hearing from people as you're going around campaigning that are really important to people? I know education is big. In Davidson County in particular, that is one of the largest employers as far as teachers and and staff that work at, at public schools. And, you know, all over the state, if you saw, you know, what happened in May with the Red for Ed March in Raleigh, with 20,000 either educators or educator supporters marching to Raleigh, you know, with their concerns about raising teacher pay to the national average, raising per pupil spending to the national average. That's no different of a story in my district. And particularly other issues related to education are school safety. I've talked to the superintendent in one of our school districts, and they want more control over things that are important at a local level, like a school calendar. You know, we just got hit with Hurricane Florence. We're dealing with what is happening after that. And every county in North Carolina has a unique story to what the disaster relief is going to look like. But they have to negotiate with Raleigh right now what that looks like as far as makeup days and all that type of stuff. And and issues like that really need to be more at a local level. And that's a concern, particularly for education. One other big area is healthcare. We are a state that has still not expanded Medicaid. And that is a huge problem that's related to maybe anywhere between half a million to 600,000 North Carolinians who do not have health care. So that trickles down to a lot of things related to can someone even live, you know, their quality of life. So those are some huge issues that I'm hearing about that I want to have an immediate ability to change if I get elected. So we've mentioned this in some other states that we've looked at, but the pay for a state senator in North Carolina is extremely low. It's around $14,000 a year, plus some per diem and expenses. So I assume this is meant to be a part-time position. Do you know what that sort of looks like for the people who are state senators and, and what else they need to do then to make ends meet? You know, that is a wonderful point and question. It is considered part-time work. So I mentioned that I'm a full-time professional in higher ed, and I do not plan on leaving my job. I can't. You know, I, I'm a big part with both my husband and I of supporting our family. And I don't quite know how we're going to do that. You know, that's just me being honest. I don't I don't know what that's going to look like. I have talked to current legislators and just asked, you know, what's your schedule look like? And it's multiple days you know, for a long session in particular where you're expected to be in Raleigh, sometimes in the evening, but sometimes during the day, you know, I think there are certain times where you have to be there at noon onward. And that cuts particularly into a schedule of someone who's working an eight to five job like I am. So that is an issue. And it's something that I've had to think about also having three kids, you know, I need to be at home (laughs) at some point to work with my husband to take care of our family. So I'm hoping that There will be a lot of new considerations here in Raleigh and in North Carolina based on these elections. And I think what a part-time legislator's responsibility is needs to be one of them. 
there are not very many young people in our legislature. And when I say young, I mean 30s, you know, my age, which isn't necessarily particularly young, but in the case of what our legislators look like, that is younger. And I don't even think there's a handful of that age group. And so when you don't have diversity in age, as well as race and background, you know, jobs, that kind of thing, you, you lose out a lot on really representing the people of North Carolina. So, you know, that's a big concern of mine that I really hope becomes an important conversation, you know, to whoever gets elected in November. You mentioned that you're a biologist and you have a PhD in microbiology and immunology. I was wondering, given that this year we've seen a a sort of swell in scientists and other science professionals running for office, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you think your science background can really add something to um, being in office. You know, this is really kind of unintentional for me. I'm not even in science as much as as maybe at one point in my life was, but the thing about me that's a true scientist is I always ask why. I ask that at every meeting I'm in. I ask that when I'm taking notes to just kind of prep myself for my day. I kind of look at the way a process is and say, why is it like this? Is it best like this? What can we do to make it better? And, you know, I think that approach to the General Assembly and the way we do things is going to be important. Um, Mm -hmm. Also, I'm going to be new to everything. So the very first thing I approach, you know, the very first way that I approach something new is to read about as much as I can to learn, connect myself with as many different types of people as possible to learn the process. And so that just process of how I think through things and learn new things, I think is an advantage. I think it's really 